Now, as Keith said, we have uh, the pleasure of each other's company for the next three Sunday evenings. And um, I was given the challenge of thinking of a, a mini-series, and I hate this kind of thing because I'm useless at making decisions. I don't, is anybody else really bad at making decisions? If there's too many options in front of you, you cannot decide what to do. So I've mulled this over for several months now, and, and I decided that for people of my generation, I think when you're presented with a list of rules or, or a list of doctrines, it really doesn't speak to us very well. What I find really impacts me or challenges me or affects me uh, is when I hear someone's story. And so what we're going to do over the next three Sunday evening services is look at the story of, of a man that, that Keith mentioned, a man called Paul. Uh, and you might know him well. You, you might not know him at all. Uh, he features in the Bible. And we're not just going to look at his story like a biography, like a, a documentary on BBC4 or something. It's going to be hopefully more life-changing than that. We're going to look deeper. We're hopefully not just going to look at the story and see where he was born, where he went to school, who his friends were, what they said about him, all that kind of stuff. But we're going to see what happened to him when he met Jesus. And we're going to see what an incredible impact it happened on, uh, had on him and what an incredible impact it can have on us. So I'm really hoping that as we, we look at this man, Paul, or Saul as he used to be called, and, and study his life and see how Jesus affected and transformed him, it should have the same transformative effect on us. Each week as well as this, because there's so much to cover, uh, I thought it would be helpful to home in on one particular theme each week, something which is key, a kind of cut, uh, touchstone to, to Paul's theology, something that, that stood right at the center of what he understood about Jesus. And we're going to home in on one each week uh, to try and guide us through the life of Paul and the experience of, of Paul as he met with Jesus. So this evening, what we're going to start off with is the idea of a second chance. And I wonder if I had a kind of magic wand or a time machine or something and I could uh, wave it or, or usher you into my sort of TARDIS thing and take you to somewhere in your life so you could have a second chance, what would it be? What would you want to have another go at or, or try again at because it hadn't quite worked out the first time? Um, I did a bit of research on this to see what people might have chosen. And, and a lot of people, it was kind of career-based. They've sort of realized that at 30 or 40 or 50 that they've just been kind of treading water in a job that, that doesn't really interest them. They fell into it uh, after they left school and they just kind of climbed the career ladder. But they wish, if they had their time again, they could have a second chance and, and do something that really inspired them, something that interested them, real job satisfaction. Maybe for you, I think like a lot of people, top of the polls, there's always stuff to do with relationships. It's, it's the boyfriend that, that you wish you hadn't left or, or the friend that you wish you hadn't kind of let that relationship grow cold and, and distant or, or the parent who you wish you'd said sorry to before it was too late. Those kind of relationships where we've made mistakes and we know we could have done more but we, we messed it up, that's where people often want a second chance. But on none of the kind of polls or the questionnaires or the things I looked at online did I find anyone mention a second chance at a relationship with God. And that's exactly what we're going to think about tonight because believe it or not, the Bible tells us that every single one of us from our birth needs to have a second chance at their relationship with God because we've messed it up. We, we've blown it. In, fa in fact, from Adam and Eve onwards, the whole human race has messed up this whole relationship with God thing. And what we're going to look at tonight as we, as we look into the life of Paul is we're going to see how, as he was, a man called Saul, he had a second chance given to him at a relationship with God. And that's what we're going to discover this evening. So, so before we go any further, before we read from the Bible and, and look at our passage for this evening, um, just to give you a bit of background on this chap, Paul. Uh, he was born in a place called Tarsus. You can probably see it on the map. It's in modern-day Turkey on the banks, on the, um, on the uh, side of the Mediterranean Sea. There, You can see it's sort of right-hand side of the screen. Um, and we don't know a lot about his, his early life. There's lots of things people say, but from the Bible, there's not a lot we can glean. We know that he traveled down to Jerusalem then uh, as quite a young man. And uh, you can see in the middle there, I think it's an artist's impression of, of Paul there with Gamaliel. And that was his, his teacher. He learned uh, under this rabbi and, and learned what it meant to follow the Jewish laws. Uh, he, he described himself as a Pharisee. I think actually it was very helpful. Keith um, read out a, a little passage from Philippians uh, chapter 3. He described himself as a Hebrew of Hebrews. He was kind of the, um, the Hebrew of all Hebrews. He, he followed all the laws. He knew the books of the, of the Old Testament inside out. You know, he could probably quote most of them verbatim without anything to prompt him. He was, he was obsessive about this. He had the brain the size of a planet, and he used all of it to focus on becoming the best Jew there was, as far as he could understand. And one of the key things to being a Jew uh, was the belief in one God. And so when a man called Jesus arrived on the scene uh, in Jerusalem, where 
where he was living at the time. Uh, Paul was absolutely, or Saul's I should say, was absolutely shocked by this. A man who claimed to be God. And when his followers didn't just fizzle out after Jesus was killed, but they began to grow in number and the church began to spread, Saul was very, very put out of joint by this. And so he began to persecute the church. And, and actually, Roger Carswell stumbled on this uh, at the start of his sermon last week, and I was, I was panicking a bit because I hadn't really got any time this week to replan my sermon. And if he stole it all, I wouldn't have anything to say. But thankfully, he kind of stopped, and thankfully, uh, he gave me a bit of a sermon to preach it's okay, I'm not just going to repeat what he said. But um, he was mentioning about how Saul became this persecutor of the church. And there was a, a young man called Stephen who was a follower of Jesus. And as he was talking about Jesus and, and talking about his faith in Jesus as the Son of God, um, this crowd, kind of this mob, uh, built up and they were throwing stones at Stephen, uh, stoned him to death. And there, complicit in that murder, was, um, was Saul. And it was said that he was there standing, holding the coats of these people, probably nodding along, pleased with what was going on. And so you get this picture painted for you in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, as, of Saul as a man who hated Christians, who hated Jesus, who despised the church and wanted to wipe it off the face of the earth. If he could eradicate the memory of Jesus from planet earth in his time, he would see that he'd had a good life. And this is Saul. And we find him next on his way to a little place called Damascus. It's in Syria today, you may well know it. And uh, he's traveling north there from Jerusalem to Damascus. And he's been given permission to go and find all the Christians he can and bring them back to Jerusalem to incarcerate them in prison. This man hated the church. And that's where we're going to pick up our story this evening. So if you have a Bible with you, I'd like you to turn to Acts chapter 9. Don't worry too much if you haven't. It'll come up on the screen as well. But Acts chapter 9 and verse 1, let's read together. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogue in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but they did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm that he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who, you, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. Now, I think this passage is not difficult to understand, is it? As a preacher, sometimes you come to a passage and it's, it's confusing and it's complicated and there's intricacies and you have to read all these big, fat, hefty tomes on it before you have a clue what it's talking about. But this passage is kind of simple. It's also ironic, I think. Perhaps one of the most ironic passages in the entire New Testament. What you have at the beginning is very different to what you have at the end, don't you think? 
At the start, you've got this chap called Saul, and his one goal in life is to destroy the church, to get the memory of Jesus out of everyone's mind and make sure that no one who follows Jesus survives. That's his aim in life. That's his job as he goes to Damascus. But fast forward 19 verses, and what do you find? A baptized believer, full of the Holy Spirit, commissioned to go and spread this message he was eradicating 19 verses earlier to the rest of the world, further than it had ever gone before, to take the gospel all the way to Rome and further if he could. What a crazy, crazy story we have right here, a complete turning upside down. And in the midst of all of this, we see that Saul is given a second chance. This man didn't deserve a second chance. We look at it here, and we think about the things he'd done, complicit in the murder of Stephen. He doesn't deserve a second chance. Think of all the families that he'd broken up. Think of all the husbands that he'd dragged away to jail. Think of all the churches that he'd destroyed. Think of all the blasphemy in his mind and in his heart. This man didn't deserve a second chance, but Jesus gave him a second chance. He wasn't looking for a second chance either, was he? Sometimes you run into people and, and it seems as though they're looking for forgiveness. They know they've done something wrong and, and it really weighs on their conscience. But, but Saul doesn't seem to fit into this category at all, unless he's really suppressing it. And maybe he was, I don't know. But it seems as though guilt isn't really part of his makeup at this moment. He, he's just angry. He's looking to, to destroy more churches, to break up more families, to put more people in prison. Maybe to be involved in the murders of more Christians, I don't know. But he's not looking for a second chance. But out of the blue, out of nowhere, Jesus, who is full of grace, who is full of love, who loves to forgive people, bursts onto the scene. And in half a chapter, he transforms this murderer, perhaps the uh, the person who hated the church more than anyone else, into the missionary of the church. It's ironic, isn't it? Why did he pick him? Crazy. It's an incredible example of a second chance. But if we dig a bit deeper, if we kind of zoom out, I suppose, a bit from just looking at Saul, we realize this isn't just talking about one man. When we read through the letters that that Keith mentioned, Paul wrote many, many letters in in the New Testament that make up almost the bulk of of what you find there. And you read through them and you realize that this isn't just a one-off. God wasn't being particularly generous just to Saul. God chooses to be incredibly generous to every single person he comes across. And the same is true no matter what they're like, whether by human standards they seem like an all right person or whether they're just as bad or worse than Saul. That means that the people that we find really hard to forgive are the sorts of people that God is quite happy to forgive and quite willing to forgive. I was just thinking about the news recently and in Londonderry there were some bombings, weren't there, just just the other week and how would you feel about giving a second chance to the men or women responsible for that? Or you think about the, the killers of Stephen Lawrence who were uh, tried last month. How would you feel about giving them a second chance? But thankfully, God is not like you or me and I'm not God and, and that's a great thing, isn't it? Because God is far more gracious than we are. He's far more loving. And he's willing to give a second chance to the very worst in society. And you know what? That includes every single one of us, doesn't it? I don't think there's anyone who's guilty of what Saul is guilty of. Each one of us is open and offered a second chance by Jesus. But as we we dig a bit deeper, I realize it's not just a a second chance uh, in the week sort of sense. I work in a school and and I find that sometimes when I'm giving, my job seems to be giving irritating children second chances. That's what I find I have to do a lot of the time. In lessons, I'm sort of telling them to be quiet and they're not quiet, so I tell them again. and And it's just forever giving second chances. Maybe you're a parent and you give second and third and fourth and fifth chances and you know you shouldn't, but but you do. But these sorts of second chances, the second chance we find here that Jesus gives to Saul. It's not a weak kind of second chance. Sometimes it seems as though you give someone a second chance, and really it's just another way of saying, we're going to sweep what happened in the past under the carpet. We're going to forget about it. Is that what God's doing here? When he finds this, this verging on a murderer, this fundamental, uh, fundamentalist, religious nutcase who's, who's bent on destroying churches and killing people and putting them in prison. When he finds this man, is God saying, let's just sweep it under the carpet. Forget about it, Saul. Don't worry, it's in the past. If he is, I don't know if that's the kind of God that I could respect. But actually, when you begin to read through what Saul, or Paul as he became known as, writes about this second chance, you realize it's something far greater than that. He's not just looking at the past and saying, let's just ignore it, it's an awkward kind of elephant in the room. 
Actually, what he says is far more amazing. Um, I'd like us to turn to a book which Saul actually wrote. He was called Paul by that point. It's a book called Romans. Uh, he wrote to some Christians uh, in Rome. So please turn with me to chapter 8 of Romans, if you've got a Bible in front of you. Not to worry if you don't, I've got, I'll read it out to you. But in the book of Romans, chapter 8, Paul kind of talks about this. Is he sweeping the wrong things that Saul has done under the carpet, or is Jesus doing something far more amazing than that? Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do, in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his son, sorry, sending his own son, in the likeness of sinful man, to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in sinful man in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the sinful nature but according to the spirit. If you were to ask Saul or Paul as he was later known, did God just give you a second chance, kind of sweep the past away? He'd say absolutely not. My God is fair. Think of all the families I wrecked. Think of all the churches I destroyed. God couldn't just turn a blind eye to that. But God deals with the things in the past properly, and he deals with them fairly. And the section I want to just focus in on there, in, in chapter 8 of Romans, is just a few words there. Saul says, or Paul says, that God sent his son, Jesus, into the world to be a sin offering. Now what he means there is that everything that Saul had ever done wrong, everything which he'd ever done which offended God or offended others or hurt other people, all the damage that he caused, all the wrong that he had done. God didn't forget about it. God didn't sweep it under the carpet. He didn't turn a blind eye and say that the past doesn't matter. It matters to God because he's fair. He didn't let him get away with it, but he didn't punish Saul. He sent his son Jesus, who willingly went to the cross and was nailed to a cross and was punished for every single one of those wrong things that Saul had done. Every single one of those sins was punished for by Jesus. And it wasn't just restricted to Saul. Uh, this is true, what is written in Romans, for every single one of them, uh, uh, one of us, for, for me, for you, for every person that you can pass in the street, for every single person in our world. The incredible second chance which God offers to us in Jesus doesn't just forget about our past, but it deals with our past so that we can be forgiven properly. But beyond that, I think another problem with giving someone a second chance is that sometimes you give them a second chance, but there's no way they can do any better than they did the last time. Um, I have a confession for you. My confession is that I'm a secret MasterChef fan. Does anyone else like MasterChef? Oh, I'm not a man. There you go. Dave's with me. That's good. Um, and I don't really know why I like MasterChef, because I don't really like cooking all that much. But I seem to like watching people cook nice food. Or maybe I like them getting stressed and panicking and getting shouted at by scary head chefs and things like that. But um, it would be a great job, wouldn't it, to be a MasterChef judge? Wouldn't that be amazing? To be the, the bald one who just doesn't know anything about cooking but eats all the food and stuff. It's good. But, um, but it's really good, I think, when they get sent into the professional kitchens and they have something really crazy to make, like, I don't know, well, I can't even think what it is now, but a comfy of something or other with a, a foam of something else. And, and you know, you get those little balls they make out of, like, gelatine and they drop them in and it all looks fancy. And they're doing this in a professional restaurant. And the professional head chef man is shouting at them and then they take what they've made up to the past and they put it there and he says, rubbish, sends them away and they go back again. And now he could say, I'm going to give you a second chance. And he sends them away. And they come back again, and their little kind of gelatine ball things haven't set again, and he says, rubbish, and he sends them away, and then their phones all, phones all doesn't mind whatever foam isn't supposed to be, and then they come back, and the comfy of whatever that is has fallen apart, and, and every time, they could have a thousand chances, but because they don't know what they're doing, they, they can't make it work. And what they really need is for him to say, well, look, do this, do this, do this, and show them what to do, or equip them somehow to be able to do it properly. And so when Saul was given this second chance, yes, his past was dealt with. His, his sin or the wrong things he'd done was taken away. It was nailed to the cross of Jesus. But how about now? You know, maybe Saul was thinking to, myself, what, to himself, what am I going to do now? How am I going to kind of quit the, the habits of my old life? He, he knew how sinful he was. I think in our culture, we don't realize quite how bad we are. We don't realize how we don't match up to, to how God wants us to be. 
But, but for a, a good Jewish man like Saul, he would have known how sinful he was. He would have known he doesn't match up to God's standards. And he'd probably be thinking to himself, what next? How can I do it? But notice a little detail in chapter 9. What does Ananias say? He says uh, that he's going to make sure that Saul gets back his sight. But I think we're looking in verse 15, is it? No, a little bit further down. There we go, verse 17. He says, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus has appeared to you, who appeared to you on the road uh, when we were coming here, has sent me so that you can see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. This second chance isn't just kind of God saying, oh, well, I hope Saul's going to do a bit better this time. Go on, Saul, you can do it. Go, Saul. Yeah, and hoping that he'll do just a little bit better than he did last time and, and, and I don't know, throw a few less Christians in jail. He's not just hoping on a blind hope that, that Saul's going to be a bit better this time. God actually does something about it so that this second chance is foolproof. He's dealt with all the sin in his past and in his present and in his future by nailing it to the cross of Jesus. But he also does something far uh, or even more amazing than that, even better for him. He fills him with the Holy Spirit. And this is an incredible thing which is true for every single Christian sitting here. Um, Paul writes elsewhere in his writings that we're temples of the Holy Spirit. So in the Old Testament, they used to have a big building where God used to dwell physically on earth. But we don't have that now. This building is no more kind of holy or sanctified than Asda or Tesco or anything. This is just a big brick building. But the place where God exists is in human beings who have trusted in Jesus. That's where God exists here on earth, physically. He is in Christians. That's his temple now. And the incredible thing is that um, Paul talks about this loads. He, he says that, that what has happened now is the Holy Spirit is in us to change us. To make us more like Jesus, to make sure that we don't keep going backwards, that we don't just tread water, kind of spiritually speaking, but we become more and more like Jesus who we're following. And isn't that a brilliant thing? Isn't that amazing? This second chance is completely foolproof. Are we going to slip back into our old ways and start sinning again? Well, the sin is dealt with. It's been punished. It's been forgiven. Are we going to just gradually deteriorate and go back to the way we were? Well, the Holy Spirit is working in us, changing us, making us more like the person we should be. It's incredible, isn't it? It's wonderful news, this, this fantastic second chance. And the great news is that it isn't restricted to Saul. You read through the pages of the New Testament, you look as people bump into Jesus and meet Jesus and hear the preaching of Jesus and see the miracles of Jesus and experience Jesus in visions and hear about him as he's preached about in Acts. And every person who bumps into Jesus and hears this message is transformed, is given a second chance, is turned around and upside down and inside out. And um, Think about a few people. The woman at the well. You may know this story. It doesn't matter if you don't. But basically, she had a really dubious past. She's had several husbands, other sexual partners. Um, all of society had kind of kicked her out. She's on the outskirts. But it's not too far for Jesus to bring her back in, to give her a second chance. She's not beyond it. And he forgives her sin and fills her with the Holy Spirit, we can assume. Think about Zacchaeus. You remember this guy? He's, he's really little, but he's also a petty, nasty, horrible man. Doesn't care about people, just cares about money. Completely selfish, a bit of a materialist. Would fit in very well in some parts of our culture. But he's not beyond the forgiveness of Jesus. And Jesus gives him a second chance and turns him around. The Holy Spirit fills him eventually, I guess after Pentecost. And so with that, he begins to grow and change and become more like Jesus. Think of another character, the criminal on the cross next to Jesus. Now this man, to be crucified, must have done the most horrendous crimes. I don't even know what they were. We wouldn't probably want to talk about them in the pulpit. But this man turns to Jesus for forgiveness. Is he beyond this second chance? Has he done too much? Is he too evil? No. Jesus welcomes him into paradise, forgives him, gives him a second chance. And, and what about ordinary people like you and me? I, I was thinking about James and John. Now, the first time we see them in the Gospels, they're, they're just rather full of themselves. They're always saying to Jesus, well, you know, Jesus, we, we, we're the best, really. We should probably have kind of the, the big important seats. We should be the, the main guys in your apostle crew thing. And, uh, and he's, he, they're just really full of themselves and really arrogant and always interested in themselves. And maybe that's all it is with you. Maybe you've never murdered anyone. You're not a fraudster. You haven't been particularly uh, sexually, um, what's the word, outlandish or anything. But maybe it's just you're always thinking of yourself thinking of others. Whatever it is, we've all fallen short of where we should be. And I think if we take a bit of time to, to think about it and reflect on it, we can realize that. 
But the amazing message which transformed Saul and turned him into Paul is that every single one of us can have a second chance. If we look around this building tonight, it's full of people, many of whom are Christians. And if there are people here tonight who aren't Christians, the only difference between the Christians and the non-Christians is that the people who are Christians have said, please, Jesus, I want to take your second chance. I want to take you up on it. Please forgive me. Please fill me with your Holy Spirit and make me more like you want me to be. It's not because we're better than anybody else. It's not because we're more holy or we've done less wrong things. In many cases, it's the complete opposite. Just look at Saul. But this offer of a second chance is open to every single one of us. Now, the last thing I was thinking before we close with a song is that there might be some people here tonight who are Christians and they can remember, just like Saul, when Jesus broke into their life and gave them a second chance and turned everything around. I can remember it well, but it seems a bit distant now. And kind of as time's gone on, things have got in the way and perhaps it's kind of a little wedge of sin that's just growing and, and, and beginning to separate you from, from where you should be in your relationship with Jesus. Or maybe it's just distractions of the world and you know things are, are just not where they were. And you can remember being forgiven. You remember getting that second chance. But now it kind of feels as though you've blown it. And you feel as though you need a third chance or maybe a fourth chance in your case or a fifth chance or whatever. And I was thinking about this and trying to think, well, what would Saul say to this? Or what would Paul say to this, the converted man? And I think he'd say that you do not need a third chance or a fourth chance or a fifth chance or anything like that. Because the second chance that Jesus gave you is still good. Let's uh, just look momentarily at a little bit of Hebrews. Now, some people used to think the Hebrews is written by Paul. I don't think it is, but it's part of the Bible, so it's still good. So we'll turn there. Uh, Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 11. Uh, don't worry too much if you aren't there. And I'm going to read a bit to you about priests. Now, it might not seem immediately clear why I'm reading this, but hopefully it will become clear in a second. Uh, now, in the Old Testament, the priests were kind of the ones who represented the people to God and God to the people. They were the sort of middleman uh, in religious uh, society. And in verse 11 of chapter 10, uh, the writer of Hebrews says this, day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest, that's Jesus they're talking about, had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. Because by one sacrifice he, was made perf he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. You might think to yourself, oh, I've blown it, you know. I, I was doing so well in my Christian life, but I never read my Bible anymore. I never tell anyone at work about, about Christianity. You know, I, I wish that I hadn't done that, or I wish that I'd, I'd kind of waited till we were married, or I wish that I hadn't uh, embezzled that money, or whatever it might be, all these things which we could do, which drive a wedge between us and God. And you might think that you've blown it and you need another chance. But the truth is that Christ sac was sacrificed for your sins once for all. Every sin you might ever commit, even today, even tomorrow, even in the future, Jesus has dealt with it. And he dealt with it definitively in that moment when you came to him for the first time. That second chance still stands. Why is it that God would not judge you if you stood before him in heaven today? It's not because of anything you do. And so surely it can't be because of anything you do that you reverse that. Fantastic news. Why is it that you are counted as righteous? It's not because of your own righteousness, so you can't muck it up. It's because of the righteousness of Jesus that you are made righteous. It's wonderful news. Now, I'm not saying that, that you take that for granted. I'm not saying that you do whatever you like. Uh, actually, the Apostle Paul, he ended up having a discussion a bit like that in the book of Romans. He says, by no means, we, we press on, we try and follow Jesus with everything we've got. We live the life that he wants us to live. We let the Holy Spirit change us. But if you're lacking assurance tonight, if you feel as though you've blown it and you need another chance, just come back to the chance that he gave you when you first trusted him. His forgiveness is still good. Jesus' righteousness is still good. You still have that second chance. Be assured. Now we're going to pray, and then we're going to sing a song that picks up on a lot of these themes. Uh, the chorus says, 
Because of your cross, my debt is paid. Because of your blood, my sins are washed away. Now all of my life I freely give. Because of your love, I live. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Saul. We thank you that he is a wonderful example to us of your second chance that you give. Thank you that Jesus was willing to pay for our sin. Thank you that he is willing to give us his righteousness. Thank you that you give us your Holy Spirit. You give us so much. And all we do is thank you for it. We praise you for everything you've done for us. We thank you that the second chance is open to anyone who would take it. And I pray for anyone tonight who realizes that they need a second chance from you. I pray that they would make that step and choose to be forgiven. And choose to follow you and receive the wonderful gift of a second chance. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.